Hey, everybody. Welcome to Res Gen's Giving Life Podcast. Stories and conversations about life in Christ, everyday discipleship, and exploring ways that we as men can give life to others. My name is Tom Henderson, speaker, author, and founder of Res Gen, and I am so glad you are joining us today for another episode of the Giving Life Podcast. My guest today has been bringing joy and making people laugh all over the world through both his stand-up comedy and his social media videos for years, and I have no doubt that you are going to enjoy getting to know comedian Dustin Nickerson. Dustin's a husband, a father, a former youth pastor, I can't wait to hear more about that, and a follower of Christ. And not to mention, he has an amazing ability to riff on literally anything going on in culture today. He also has his own podcast entitled Don't Make Me Come Back There, but today he is kind enough to join us here on the Giving Life Podcast to talk about such things as dealing with the pressure of always having to be funny, how his faith influences his life in comedy, and how he strives to give life to his wife and his kids when he's on the road. I hope you're ready for a good time. Here is my conversation with comedian Dustin Nickerson. So Dustin Nickerson, man, it's great to have you on the Giving Life podcast. Absolutely, man. Thanks for thanks for having me. Thank you for setting up like and I've I've been staring at this for a while and I can't is that is that a green screen or is that just what Sioux Falls looks like or what is what is going on behind you? It's very it's all blurred out very artistically. Yeah, we, <laughs> this is one of the most beautiful places on earth, Sioux Falls, South Dakota. And and when you come here yeah. in October, you're going to get to see it. Yeah, it looks like you just changed the background on your Zoom call. Is what it looks like. It looks like an old Microsoft ninety four Rolling Hills de- desktop. You know, it's really nice. I like what you've done with the place. Well, thank you, thank you. We've worked hard on it. Just for you, just for you, we did this. And I appreciate, <laughs> I appreciate you growing a beard um, as yeah. well during this whole Corona uh, season that we're in, so that we could be bearded brothers. Yeah, I mean, evaluating what's on my face using the beard term is generous at best. <laughs> it is more just a collection of random hairs. It's it's uh, it's got it's it's like it's, it's I have the beard of a Dalmatian. It's like very <laughs> spotty and um, it's uh, but it's there. But like I, I you know, I, I I've, I've said this to you, but like it's if it, people even categorizing it as a beard feels good to me. You know what I mean by that? Like someone like he has a beard of like, thank not a good beard, but, it, but it's there. It, it looks like, it looks like an effort, <laughs> yeah. you know, well, back when I was in school, they used to give you two grades where it was, this is your actual grade for the class. And this is your grade for your effort. And I always thought it was interesting right. where I would say you'd get an A for an effort, but you'd get a C in the class. So it's just, <laughs> <laughs> so it's basically you tried really hard, but you didn't succeed. <laughs> Oh, man. Well, you know, one of the goals that we have of our podcast is just to make people feel good and give life. So just knowing that me calling what you have as a beard made you feel yeah. good, I feel like we mi- yeah. we accomplished yeah. the mission. you blessed to be a blessing. We just fulfilled <laughs> the Abrahamic covenant right here, buddy. Just this compliment right there. I love it. Okay, so so it's super fun to have you on the podcast. And and you and I actually got connected uh, earlier this year through another mutual friend of mine, uh, Bone right. Hampton, who I've done events with in the past. And and yeah. Bone was all set to, to do a, a, a parents' night with me here in town. And then it, things didn't work out. And, and so he texted me and said, Hey Tom, I'm sorry, I just can't make it. And so I said, Hey, do you happen to know a guy by the name of Dustin Nickerson? And he said, well, totally I know Dustin. And I said, well, would you ever be able to connect me uh, with him? Because, and just see if there's any openness for him to join us for parents night. And then text messages were exchanged. And yeah. I mean, brotherhood through beards was, was, yeah. uh, it was created. And, yeah. So now here we are on a podcast together. Everything that you just said is so prototypical for my career. <laughs> it starts with someone else being unavailable. <laughs> That's the genesis of my booking was someone being available. And then the follow up question. Have you ever heard of Dustin Nickerson? I said again, where no one makes any assumption. Like you've never been like, have you ever heard of Jim Gaffigan? Have you, <laughs> you know, so we're working there. And then the third part is you texting me directly. No agent, 
no manager, no representation, just a text. <laughs> well, luckily our mutual friend, he, he connected us via text and asked permission. So I don't feel like I yeah. stalked you or anything. No, no, um, no. But... I'm just saying there wasn't like some formal inquiry <laughs> process. Like if you wanted to book a real comedian, you would have had to gone through a lot more work than texting him directly. Uh, well, I'll tell you this. I've already laughed more in these few minutes than I have with, so, with uh, some ahead, real comedians. Ahead. All right. So, oh, good, good, so good, there, good. I've made you feel good twice in, in like the first five minutes. That's pretty good. Yeah. All right. Yeah, so, so you're in Vegas right now with a, lo- a lovely pink hue to the room. I know. <laughs> you know, because if Vegas is known for anything, it's its subtlety. <laughs> it's really, it's a very nuanced city, you know. Right. And so, yes, my family and I are staying in New York, New York, which if you know Vegas at all, you know that's a very affordable area. <laughs> that's the one word to say. It's it's fine. And uh, But I'm we're in one of the, the pink windowed rooms, so... It like I it's again, it doesn't do me. I was already sunburned, obviously. <laughs> yeah. And so this just adds to it. I can't believe that somebody who lives in Sioux Falls has a better tan than me. I live in San Diego. <laughs> right. And you <laughs> you guys get you guys get the sun for a month a year <laughs> right. at best. Right. That's why I don't and live inside. For a whole month I'd never exactly. live inside. But it's because we uh, can't go outside in January. That's the problem. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, what you don't realize is that Tom in January is translucent. <laughs> he's like, he's like, he's like a jellyfish. You can see through him. <laughs> All right, so let's get to know you a little bit here, real quick. Well, let's, so tell me about. You just said that you got a family vacation, so you got a wife, you got kids, you live in San Diego. What else do we need to know about you? That's it. I think about covers it. Uh, born and raised in Seattle, Washington. Uh, I was the, uh, there for twenty-seven years. Moved down to California nine or ten years ago. As a comedian, I should live in L.A., but uh, I hate L.A., so I live in San Diego, which is uh, a much better city. Um, I tell jokes. That's that's you know that's 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 the synopsis. Yeah. About yeah. You know. <laughs> I, I like it. I like it. So tell me about just like the type of comedy. So someone that maybe hasn't heard you do comedy yet, which this is going to set the world on fire. Everybody will know who you are after this <laughs> podcast. Okay, but uh, but yeah, I've seen the you world do... is already on fire, Tom. <laughs> the whole world. <laughs> so so what kind of comedy would you say that? How would you describe yourself as a comedian? Um. The, you know, uh, it's a little bit like the beard thing. Like, it, did they, you even identify it as a beard is a win. That you even identify me as a comedian is a big win for me. Uh, the type of, I can't, some people are like really good at like writing jokes, which this is a bad sell for me as a comedian to be like, I'm not good at writing jokes. It's not, <laughs> like, take a pastor be like, I'm bad at sermon. It's not. <laughs> I don't lo- like people, um, uh, but no, the, I, I can, I've only figured out a way to be funny talking about things that are happening, things in my life, things in the world, things about current events, things about, you know, family and kids. And, you know, I, I feel like I just have to reflect kind of what's going on in my life and the world. That so that, that's the goal. Really. Yeah. It all comes down to, uh, relationships my relationship with people, my family, my kids, the world, my take on things, and it, you know, that, that's, that, that's kind of the, the, the sweet spot for me, you know, so much. So I was talking to, I was talking to, uh, my wife about this. One of my uh, favorite comedians, this guy named Aaron Weber, really funny guy. And he has this great joke where he says me and my girlfriend were going vegan together, but then she cheated on me with five guys. <laughs> Which is an unbelievable joke. That's so good. It's a very funny joke. I I could never write that joke. And if I just said that in the middle of my act, people would be like, what are you doing? Why did we turn into now and later jokes or, you know, whatever, like uh, now and later later jokes. But you know what I mean? Like it's it's a joke joke. Yeah. And because it's like it's me taking a brand. uh, uh, I would be like taking a. Uh, you know, a break from a five minute rant about how much I hate middle schoolers to tell a joke. And everybody would be like, what's going on? <laughs> I mean, like you, you were sweating a second ago and now you just told a joke that I'd hear on a popsicle stick. So yeah, so that's, that's kind of my brand and the kind of stuff we're doing. Well, you, you said, you said a couple of things there and I want to come back to the hating middle schoolers because what's interesting is like a lot of people, you know, they, they may not know that you were actually former, formerly a youth pastor. So I want to get into that. So, yeah, it yeah, was the worst youth pastor. <laughs> uh, I like stay in touch with my 
like I was texting an old youth group friend of mine the other day and uh, we were just texting about like um, a couple different things. And, and he, he said he was complimentary, but then I was like, man, I was like, I was like, man, I was such a bad youth pastor. And he was like, well, nobody's really good at much in their early twenties. And I was like, Oh man, he didn't let me off the hook. You know, like he agreed with me. <laughs> <laughs> you were looking for the, no, you were great. The kids loved you. you. Were so great. <laughs> no, they didn't. They know that they didn't. Uh, they know that I didn't, uh, love them. Like I didn't, I loved them. I didn't enjoy them. Sure. I don't, I don't like that age group, you know? And, uh, and it showed, <laughs> but you know, when you're in ministry, like, cause for me, I got into ministry, not really knowing what I wanted to do. It was just kind of a, a you know, a, a path for me. I, I knew as a young adult, I knew I had something to say. And so I started off as a journalist and then doing sports writing and, and different writing and speaking and different things. And, and then I got into, I was like, well, maybe it's like the speaker thing or the pastor thing. And, you know, I was just I, it's not the best reason to get into ministry, like, but it really was like, hey, you know, I have something to say. Yeah. And then comedy was like, oh no, this is what it's actually. And I'm so sorry for all those kids that I was a bad youth pastor too. <laughs> but it's probably good training because there's often times where you're standing up in front of students, especially speaking, and they might not be necessarily super into what you're saying. And as a yeah. comedian, you feel the pressure of standing on a stage. And when you yeah. when you label yourself as a comedian and it's on the poster yeah. and all this, it's like when you come hear me, you are going to laugh. That's a lot. Right. Of, that's a lot of pressure. It is a lot of pressure. It absolutely is. Yeah. It's like uh, everyone talks about like, oh, my pastor is so funny. And I was like, that's because you don't expect him to be funny. You know, like if your pastor is not funny or if your pastor is funny and he just like works in a joke or two, you didn't see comedy coming. You're just thrilled that it's there, you know, <laughs> yeah. like it's this, oh my gosh, I didn't know this was going to be here. I'm so happy that it's here. And uh, introducing a comedian is a totally different thing. It's like, mm, okay, we'll see, uh, you know, like yeah. uh, once you get that label term. But I, I, you know, people talk to me all the time, like about like bad gigs and, you know, comics and stuff like that. And they're like, oh gosh, the open mics, which I mean, I've done all of them. I've been in, I've done pretty much every show there is to do. And, uh, and they're like, ah, oh, you know, all these bad shows. It's like, I don't know, man. You ever tried to give a message at midnight at the junior high lock-in? <laughs> yeah. That's that's a tough crowd. Right it is there. a tough crowd. They're all jacked up on mellow yellow and pizza. Dude, and <laughs> dude, the worst, the worst, maybe the worst comedy gig I ever did was at junior high lock-in. I was pretty early, and I couldn't like, I just, I wasn't at a point where I could say no to it. You know, there's always a price. You know, yeah. there's always like. Like someone says, do you want to go to South Dakota? And I say, no. And then they say, you know, well, they go for this much. I go, fine. You know, it's just like. <laughs> Wait, that's hypo uh, that's hypothetical, right, Dustin? Purely hypothetical <laughs> right. example. Purely hyperbole. But the, um, the uh, I was like pretty early on. And it's like, it's in, I get there and they're like, oh, so just so you know, you're going to go on at about 1230. I'm like, why? <laughs> Why could I not be the earlier entertainment for this? And like, we're going to do like some announcements and then bring you up. And what they did for announcements was every single kid in there uh, got a giant size pixie stick. You know, like, uh, you, like the, the, you know, the jumbo one. Yeah, the that jumbo. Like a foot and a half. <laughs> they, and they pounded it. And then they said the, uh, the, they had a contest for who could scream the longest. Oh, brutal. Brutal. <laughs> and so I followed eight minutes of junior high screaming at the top of their lungs as they run around, literally bouncing off the walls. And I'm supposed to go do my 30 minutes on marriage, you know, like, or whatever <laughs> jokes that I have. Like, oh, God. It was, it was, uh, and I paint that picture and I want you to let you know, as bad as you think that it, that might've gone, it went worse. It went. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. I love that. So, so with the pressure that comes, cause no matter what job you have, and there's a lot of dudes out there that are listening right now, probably a lot of people that, I mean, have jobs, they feel the pressure to perform and, and all that. And you feel that pressure every time you you know, stand on stage or you put out a video. And when you hit, cause you do both, um, of course, stand up comedy 
And then you've got a lot of your videos that, are, that you put on social media and website and different things like that. And when you push send or post, or you say, yes, I'm going to come and stand on a stage, there's like a, a pressure to do with that. So how do you deal with that pressure just personally? Uh, not well. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, the stage I'm very used to. The stage I have been doing you know, before COVID, I mean, this break right now, the, I, I, I tell, I tell you that the days that I've taken off since COVID hit is greater than the de- total days I've taken off over the last five years. Wow. You know, I mean, I would do about 300 shows a year, mm. you know? So like I would just kind of get, which, so there was no more fear. I would be annoyed by bad shows or bad crowd, but I wasn't scared of them because I knew how to do it. Mm-hmm. You know, I was like, ah, this isn't going to be as fun. I was hoping it would be fun. Comedy is usually a lot of fun, but sometimes it's not. And, uh, uh, but the, the social media one is different. I was talking to my wife about this yesterday of, you know, social media, you, um, you don't have the, uh, the luxury of being in a room. People are inherently more understanding and empathetic when you're in a room with them that you also as a comedian you know you are not comedy is not the only thing that people see in their social media feeds Hmm. and so you might be this weird conjecture with something else that they just saw that had nothing to do with comedy you know like i did this video on kanye west before this was before the bigger meltdown but when he first announced that he's going president and i remember had someone go on like and she was like, well, you know, why are you making jokes about this? Like that. And I was like, Oh, I'm like, I'm a comedian. This is the thing that I would do, you know, but she didn't, she literally didn't even have a category for it. She didn't know if I was news or comedy. And, and it's when somebody's not in the room, it's very easy to just kind of paint this label for them. So I'm trying to just like, I try and learn from the things that people say. I always tell people in my comment sections, what is always welcome here is respectful dialogue and jokes those are always welcome here you know like if you because of course i of course i'm gonna say things that's why i like being in the comments because i know that sometimes i am going to say things that i shouldn't have said Mm -hmm. and that's good for me to hear yeah or you know or i'm gonna get responsive just like people didn't get it or you know like it's 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 it that's the same thing as the feedback that an audience is gonna give me social media is just a lot you know like because someone wouldn't it's a lot less likely that someone would come up to you after a show and be like, that was offensive, you know, or, you know, you're a bigot or yeah. you're uh, a snowflake or whatever these stupid terms are that we have. Uh, but they'll do it in the comments all day <laughs> yeah, long. With their picture <laughs> attached that you can link and I see know. who they are, their Christmas photos. <laughs> I know, I know. I'm always amazed at how, you know, you also sometimes have to remember that, you know, I don't have a massive amount of fans, but I do have fans. And I do, I have people that listen to my podcast and they, they really know me and know my take on things. But a lot of the time people are just hearing your thing for this. The only thing they've ever heard from you. Yeah. And so they have no backstory. They, and I'm guilty of that too. I totally consume social media that way. And you just will hear a clip from somebody and you'll like, and you just judge them entirely. And I, I've told people, I've told trolls before all the time, like, listen, I'm not as conservative as you want me to be. And I'm not as liberal as you want me to be either. Yeah. Whichever where you want me to be, I'm not going to fit into that. You know, the only, the only thing that I, the only hill that I'll die on is free speech and jokes. Those are the only hills, yeah. you know, <laughs> like, so, I mean, I'm not gonna, you know, I can't, I, your passion thing is not going to be that's another thing that I'm trying to understand. I know this is a ranty response to me, but me trying to empathetically understand why people get worked up. Like there's a real opportunity for us to learn as humans, as and me as a person to learn why people get emotional about certain things hmm. that I don't get emotional about. You know, I'll give you a, I'll give you a controversial example. Guns, guns are, and I'm not going to give you a gun take. Yeah. I grew up with like guns in my house but I've never cared about guns. I've never really liked them. They just don't do anything for me. And some people love them. Some people love to hunt and they love the thing. And that's, and that's their thing. And that's that's fine. (laughs) What's that? That's South Dakota. That's South Dakota. (laughs) Yeah. Oh no, that's funny. Actually, one of my favorite memories about South Dakota is, so I was, 
on a big tour that came through there. And I traveled with my golf clubs because we would do that. And yeah. so I flew in, which some of people was like, did you just bring your golf clubs to South Dakota? <laughs> you know, it's like, uh, I mean, there's space here. Yeah. But, you know, <laughs> I, I go into, uh, you know, the oversized luggage. You know what I mean? Yep. So there's, you can get your bug. And then there's this area where, and there were like 40 dudes in camels waiting for their guns. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's usually people waiting for their car seats, like, their <laughs> golf clubs, yeah. all guns. Not, all not, guns. not but, in October here. <laughs> right, exactly. But again, I don't care. I, you know, it's, it's uh, clearly your amendment, right? I don't have a strong take on guns, you yeah. know, like, but the, uh, I did a video about those gun owners, those guys, you know, who were out waving their guns out in front of their house, that couple, um, as the, you know, the protest came by and I was just being silly about it and talking about how these, they, in their minds, they look so tough and it didn't, but I, to me, it was all in jest, but right. what I didn't realize is people, I was hitting the don't take our guns button and I didn't even mean to, but I've just, I pulled back and I was talking to my wife and I was like, I just, I, I want to understand why i want to understand people and why this is so important to me it'll help me just empathetically understand and plus i think it'll help me be funnier and have a more nuanced take yeah you know? <laughs> yeah so anyways is, we're really diving into it here no guns. i love it i love it and and the thing is like I, I have two boys uh one's 19 gonna be a freshman in college and then one that's gonna turn 16 here in, in a couple months and, and be a sophomore in high school and the sophomore is not as much into social media and all of that but my older son is and i always talk about just thinking about what you're posting because it's such a one-sided conversation and people feel like totally. a great deal of, of, um, protection. They feel just this great deal of freedom to post whatever they mm -hmm. want. But I was talking yeah. about, I, I think about Herm Edwards, the old coach of the New York jets. Yeah, and, and of course. Yeah. When you he, mean the current coach of the Arizona State Sun Devils? Yeah. <laughs> yes, but so, <laughs> but so at any rate, but I remember him when he was a sportscaster, though, and he always talked about the three most important words that he would share with his players, and they were "don't hit send," and and it, and it wasn't like you never post anything, you never. It's not that you never send a test me text message, but always think about that prior to doing it, uh, because you don't know how people are going to receive that. And I got to imagine that as a comedian, that is, that is difficult because especially you, and I even said it in your introduction, by the way, which you did not hear. Uh, but my introduction was that you have the uncanny ability to riff on literally any cultural, uh, conversation or issue. It's, it's amazing. And how quick you can oh, get it out sense. there. You do. And I mean, my most, my favorite recent one is, is, uh, the dad bod one with Zach Efron, <laughs> <laughs> which, which was, that was so gold, dude. I mean, that was so gold, but, but you know, sometimes those, those culture issues, like we're talking about, they are hot buttons for people. And because they don't know, yeah. your, they don't know your heart. You know, they don't, they don't know. Heart, yeah. and, and that's such a hard thing uh, to, to balance, especially in today's culture. Yeah, I agree with that. And I'm trying to do because, you know, really, I've always done some stuff of video, but I've always it's always been stand up in the podcast for me. And what I, my podcast is called Don't Make Me Come Back There. And it's, yep. we talk to people about family life. And that stuff is the most interesting stuff in the world to me is where people came from, what their family life was like. I'm not, in, I'm so uninterested in who people are. I'm more interested in why they are. Why are people the way they are? You know, like I'm, I like people and I, 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 I do despite my, I, I like a few people, but <laughs> yeah. I do like, I like interesting people and uh, I like to know, and then the gun thing is, uh, listen, I, if you are into guns or, uh, you know, whatever your pat, whatever your thing is, whatever, uh, if you're into essential oils, if you're into whatever weird thing that you're into, I want to know like how you got there. And that just helps you understand people, you know, even like you said, the South Dakota thing, that's cultural. It's very cultural. Like the, the, the South and like, uh, the and, and and where I live, like the West Coast, take the dumbest uninformed shots at each other <laughs> <laughs> like, that are so far from anything near a humane conversation. You know, <laughs> like that. I just that stuff. Uh, I know I'm 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 very interested in learning about those things, but video stuff. Like I've, I've been, it's, it's less long form. It's more like what's happening in the world. You know, Nina, 
uh, Nina Simone was, um, um, you know, a, a, a singer and an artist and a civil rights activist and, um, had her own demons and, 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 in a lot of ways. But one thing that she said that always resonated with me is, to, uh, she said like an artist's responsibility is to reflect the times. Hmm. And then she said, to me, that's the very definition of an artist is to reflect the times. And to me, that just means, am I talking about, and that's just a personal thing. I don't, whatever you're doing, it's fine. Uh, but like, are you talking about things that are happening in the world? And those videos are just an easier way to do it. And I, I'm, I'm glad that people resonate with them. The send news thing that I've been doing, people seem to be resonating with and the views are good or better than I usually get on stuff. And like, all right. I mean, and people are starting to send me news stories that they want me to respond to. And, yeah. Uh, I like it. I like that. Uh, I, and, and, and some of that stuff too, like, you know, if I'm doing a bunch of jokes on like, somebody's like, dude, you need to do some jokes about how, you know, these baseball games that nobody are going to, that's like a good example of like, yeah, doing a little video about that, but I would never want to do that on stage, you know, cause like, whatever, what's he talking about? Uh, yeah. Like you just, it's a good way to respond to things that are happening right now and, and write jokes about it. So thank you. I'd uh, you well, know, and, I'll take every view I can get. Well, and who, and, and that probably wouldn't have happened. Um, had we not had all this time with, with total COVID. quarantine. You know, blessing. Yeah. Yep. So it's, it's the, it's the pivot. It's the yeah. adjustment that we've made that now you'll probably keep that at least part of your arsenal and part of your skill Always. set, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah. This totally. pot, this podcast here came out of just having time, all my speaking gigs getting canceled for the entire summer. Yeah. Um, and just saying, yeah. okay, well, how do we continue to, uh, give life in different ways that now you yeah. know can can live on and live on and continue yeah. that's one of the things i think that's such a great thing about this is like this can be an ongoing encouragement for people uh you know until Jesus comes back, which is absolutely, <laughs> which yeah, is a great yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. So, um so let let's talk real quick about so y you were a youth pastor for a time. Um mm -hmm. and so how did you first get connected like to faith in Christ and and was that when you were younger? Was it as a as a young man like through through college or, or tell me how that connection to Christ happened? Uh, yeah, early high school, kind of late middle school, um I, uh, I grew, so I just, uh, had a friend invite me to church. I mean, that's all it really was, you know? And it was like, uh, he invited me and we skated and it was like a, they had like a, you know, I, you know, early on in the, uh, in the, like the majority of kids on the West coast in the nineties and early two thousands got saved at, uh, through skate church. I don't know if you're familiar with skate church out totally. of Portland, but yeah, dude, Tim Burns skate... a great friend of mine. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, Tim and I have done a lot of stuff together. Yeah, skate church came and did like a thing at uh, the church that my friend invited me to. They had a bunch of skateboarders come out. A guy jumped through a ring of fire on a skateboard and then talked about how Jesus gets, gets you through the ring of fire. I don't know. The message was muddled. But, okay. you know, the so skateboarders <laughs> always like the worst of them always was a good speaker. Yeah. And, you know, <laughs> like, he's like, you're just here for the mic stuff. He's like over there like barely doing an ollie in the corner <laughs> but then has the testimony of a lifetime you know uh he's like ah, he's the only one that can memorize roman's road so i guess he's on the bus with us you know uh but i uh you know I really i was always attracted to the community you're such it's such a vulnerable age um that you know and i still like you know my son goes to youth group and you're just you're always just such a positive outlet yeah. you know regardless of where your faith kind of evolves. Like I know some folks like who are, you know, they're not even really involved in the faith, but they're still so grateful for those youth group years of just providing like healthy outlets. Cause they can be such vulnerable, dangerous years, mm -hmm. you know, that, you know, when your friend, when your kid just wants to like, go hang out with their youth leader and their friends from youth group. You're like, Oh, thank the Lord. <laughs> you know, like, So that was kind of my first connection to, uh, to really any church environment whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And so then how is your, how is your faith in Christ uh, contributed or helped you make decisions in, in your career as, as a comedian? I mean, obviously you were a youth pastor for a time and then you decided, you know what? Okay. I really don't want right. <laughs> to have this as my career and I'm going to take right. a leap into comedy. So, how has how has your faith in Christ influenced that? Has it? Um, yeah, yeah. You know, I've never had any particular interest in the label of a Christian comedian. Uh, you know, if I do three hundred gigs a year, you know, two hundred and fifty of those are in a club, right? You right. know, I'm I um, 
you know, I've, and I'm not, and I don't view myself either as like this missionary sent to the comedy club. You yeah. know? <laughs> sure. Uh, I don't, I, um, you know, to me, um, I'm, I'm more, I'm very uncomfortable around Christians. I'm much more con- comfortable in non-Christian environments. I just, I, it's the world that I grew up in. It's yeah. the world pretty much with the exception of those little stints, um, you know, in, uh, in ministry, uh, it's the world that I've almost always been in. And so, you know, it, I don't view them as separate at all, but I do just feel more like a, a comedian who happens to be a Christian in these environments, you know? Yeah. Um, so it's definitely influenced in the way that your faith would influence your life and your material and, and how you treat, treat people and, mm-hmm. and all those things. But it's not necessarily, um, um, I don't know. I don't, uh, I, you know, I, I, it's pretty minimal that I'm, um, like leading, you know, altar calls in the green room. <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> right. But I think, but the, you know, you've chosen to make your career as a, a clean comedian and to say, right. look, I'm going to, I'm going to allow this to influence and not feel like I have sure. to go a certain direction. Um, right. uh, just from our, our previous uh, interactions and, and how I've seen you over the, over the last year, as I've been listening to you and watching you so much more, it just seems you're very comfortable and in, in understanding who God's created you to be and that you can mm. go and you can be consistent in that. And that, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that any entertainer, artist, really any person, like I say, I've said this before too, like all, all you can do is try to be your most authentic self. Right. I mean, that's the only thing that you can do. And that's who I try to be. That's the reason that I'm a clean comedian is because I'm a fairly clean cut guy. You know, I'm, I'm a dad of three kids. I go to church. I'm a Christian, you know, I am, you know, but I'm also not, like in, um, I'm not like a fundamentalist Christian. Like I'm not, but I'm not also like, uh, you know, I'm not like super liberal leaning or whatever it may be. Like all you can really do. I try to, um, Tim Hawkins, I owe a lot to Tim Hawkins, but you know, one thing that was told to him that he told me a lot is you get to a point where you're not trying to write funny. You're trying to write passion. You're trying to write about things you care about. Hmm. And that's, uh, you know, kind of why I do the news stories. That's why I talk about family. Cause like, these are the, these are the things that I care about. You know, I'm trying to write. And I think it shows when you genuinely care about a topic, Yeah, you know, then, then, uh, I think it, I think it comes across, you know? So when you're on the road, I mean, you're on your road, um, with, for 300 days a year, you're not always with your, your wife and your kids. Right, I mean, yeah. it's just you're out on the road. No, and, no, no, no. Yeah, no, no. exactly. And there's a lot of guys that are listening. That, like they, they travel a lot, and they're uh, with their business yeah. and that kind of thing. So, how do you stay kind of grounded, uh, connected to faith, um, m- keeping yourself making good decisions when you're on the road when there's no one watching? I mean, obviously the Lord's watching, but you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's a fair question. I, you know, um, it's. Listen, we all have problems. There's no doubt about that. I don't have a ton of vices. I don't, like, (laughs) I don't, um, you know, like, I don't really get caught up in, like, the lifestyle of that stuff. My biggest problems on the road uh, usually are, like, laziness, (laughs) which is genuinely pretty not harmful, Um, you know. But it's part of the reason is because I'm just in constant communication with my wife, like, I'm texting her more than usually she is texting me. Like, cause she's actually busy while I'm gone. And <laughs> yeah. I'm just like, Hey, uh, my show's in 11 hours. Uh, you know? So, I mean, I don't, uh, you know, I know some of it is like the road can be very taxing. And so this is like, it's very selfish for me a lot of the time to make healthy lifestyle choices because it means I sleep better and I'm more well rested and I perform better. But you know, I, I obviously I leave, but I've been leaving so much over the last seven years that I think I feel less detached than I did in some ways because we know how to kind of go like, no, 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 we're, I'm gone, but we're in constant communication. We're FaceTime with the kids, mm-hmm. you know, like there's a, uh, it's, there's not a hard, hard break, yeah. you know? 
No, I think that's good, Dustin, because I know that that um, when I'm traveling and speaking and stuff, like Laura will often say, like, "Okay, I love it that you text me, but I do have stuff to do, right?" right? And but what I think that that's so important. What you're doing though is because you're you are showing the value and the importance of staying connected while you're right. away because it's it's easy for them to think well dad's gone you know my husband's right. gone you know are we being thought of are we being yeah. you know still loved and cared for while he's yeah. gone and so i think that's an excellent thing that you're doing and and i'm assuming yes there's times where she's probably like okay yes i got to take care of the kids but that's probably yeah. pretty life giving to cuz that was going to be with um, one of the other questions that i had for you today was you know how do you continue to give life to your kids and your wife when you're busy and yeah. when you're on the road yeah. Yeah. We, I try, you know, you try and pour into them, you try and show investment, you try and, um, I think it, I think a lot of the time it's, it's them not feeling neglected at all. Like if I go mute, you know, if I'm just like off doing my, and if I, well, I, if I'm doing uh, fun things, not to mention those things too much, <laughs> like, Oh honey, oh man, I shot an 82 today. Like, are you kidding me? Are you, um, but it's, 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 I, I'm, I'm a real, um, you know, uh, broken drum on preaching empathy, but I, it's, it's the thing to me. Hmm. It's, it's not, it's not a thing. It's the thing to me. And I think it's why Jesus was as effective as he was. Hmm. I think it's when the church is at its best and when people are at its best. It's because they don't go, ah, oh, gosh, you know, the homeless in our community, we should do something about this. And it's more, as opposed to being like hurting for the homeless in your community. And imagine if this was me and imagine if this was my family or my kids and how can, you know, and it's very similar. I try to do the same thing with my wife. Like, well, what if it was me gone and I was doing this all by myself? And as opposed to like coming in and like, well, these are my action items, you mm-hmm. know, like I don't like. I don't like practical applications because a lot of time they're just like forced in there. It's like when someone's like the key to a good marriage is a date night. I'm like, maybe, maybe it is (laughs) like, it might not be. It's a good idea, but you should be working out of the overflow of the heart. Right. And I find that when I'm trying to put myself in my wife's shoes and understand where they're at, what she's coming from, then I know what to do better. I know how Mm. to communicate with her. I know if I should Uber eats a meal for them. I know if I should, you know, whatever it may be. Uh, I know if I should call the the boy, the the oldest and say like, I should talk to him as opposed to her and be like, Hey, how can you help? All that kind of stuff. Yeah, dude. You know, and it's constant communication. Like for example, she's texting me right now from the pool saying, I gotta go, I gotta pee. How much longer (laughs) is this going to (laughs) be? I love it. I love it. As you as you asked that question, as I, that text message yeah, came down. Uh, I, like, well, I better mention this. Oh gosh, I love that, dude. I love it. And so that that is such a good word. That is such a good word uh, for. And usually I do something at the end of my podcast called the final word. I'm going to allow that to be kind of. We're going to put that awesome. in the, the final word because because your um, the, your empathy. If like if we thought like do like that, you know, when we're on the road or when we're busy, stuff. Well. How how is my child feeling? How is my kid right. feeling? How is my coworker feeling? Whatever that make, and then then what are we going to do about that? Not just think about how they're feeling. Oh well, right. that's a bummer. <laughs> but actually yeah. think about yeah. how we can do it. That's totally, like, that's not going to totally. work. But okay, well, I, dude, this is this has been super awesome. Um, I, I have absolutely loved the time that uh, that we've gotten to have together, and I can't wait yeah, man. Thanks to, for having to me. share the stage on October thirtieth with you. Um, when Stuart and yourself and me, we're going to be doing Parents Night twenty twenty. So if you're in the Sioux Falls area, um, we're going to have the opportunity to kind of hang out with you there. Um, it's it's going to be a lot of fun. So thank your wife for allowing you to hang out in the hotel room yeah. with the pink hue to yeah. talk to me and, uh, and yeah. how much that blessed us today. And we'll look Absolutely, forward to man. seeing you real soon. Cool, man. Thanks for having me. All right. See you, Dustin. Thanks for tuning in today, where my guest has been Dustin Nickerson. Be sure to follow him on all his different social media channels. And don't forget to check out his podcast, Don't Make Me Come Back There. And of course, feel free to share this episode with others who may find our conversation helpful and life-giving, or you can just keep it to yourself. Either way, we will see you next time on Res Gen's Giving Life Podcast.